Table Talk is not your typical D&D TTRPG podcast. We are not here to run you through our whole campaign. We're here to talk about everything else in the space of Table Talk. I'm your host, Alejandra Wilhelm. And I'm also your host, Mariah Gresham. And we're your tabletop roleplay girlies. Alrighty, and we're live. Yes, um, we are in fact now live. <laughs> we are in fact now live much. after, you know, some technical difficulties that we're just not gonna, we're just not gonna That's address. <laughs> Between us and God. Between us and God. It is our first remote recording though. So like it is. Us. Woo us. Um, do you do you want to have your your redemption arc? <laughs> <laughs> I love the I love the sad lead in for that. Because I was, in my head, I was just gonna like cut in valiantly and be like, I have I have a thing I need to say. But this is that's also fine and honestly probably more on brand. Um so fuck okay so uh, we were obviously people do not well not obviously because people don't know that we do this but we traditionally batch record these episodes so the first four episodes we recorded we recorded in one weekend back to back at my apartment in austin Mm -hmm. and then we've edited them and put them out into the ether and so i've had a month since the first episode when um it appeared that i did not know how uh basic multiplication tables work um and audition addition tables work so what had happened was <laughs> that mm-hmm. you said the bit where you're like oh i just like slide my dice tray over to my dm and like have him add add this things up for me and you, the joke was like like ma'am that's four d6s so in my brain what i said with my whole chest and then immediately realized it was wrong was that four plus three is seven no, mm-hmm. four plus three is twelve. Four plus three is seven. That is correct. That's what I should have said. But what my brain was trying to get me to say was that four times three, like you had you had the four D sixes and they all rolled a three. And so oh, four times three is twelve. But whatever part of my brain that controls when my mouth starts to move was like, hey, yo, hold my beer. I've got this. And it, in fact, did not have it. And so I said, 4 plus 3 equals 12 on the internet forevermore. Fully bumbled. Yeah. Which was very memeable. And as I'm explaining, as I'm saying this, it is one of those things where I'm like, oh, is this just a, I did a dumb thing and I've thought about it for like (laughs) every day since. And no one else has, potentially. But that's what happened. I, you know. The rest of your days. Yeah, no, I, yep, I did well in school. I, I took calculus and did fine in it. Like, I, you know, I'm not a whole ass idiot. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's, that's that. <laughs> on now with today's topic. Uh, I'm, I'm which glad. Is, <laughs> which considering is, today's topic is um, toxic gaming environments, maybe it's just a symptom of anxiety from being in previous toxic gaming environments and thinking I have to be perfect all the time. Oh, Who's to baby. say? But that's the segue. <laughs> that's the sad <laughs> segue of things we realize in therapy. Um, yeah, yeah. That is fully, true. Fully, fully. Like, God yeah. forbid I ever make a mistake. No, with not allowed. If not God, allowed. God help you if you're not perfect every second of the day, Mariah. Exactly. Who even are you? Um. <laughs> no yeah as as we mentioned um we're gonna be talking about toxic gaming environments specifically when dealing with toxic players as well as toxic dms or toxic tables in general um you know and how to approach those kinds of interactions to maybe you know salvage a game uh because it could just be a case of like hey Maybe we just need to have a conversation about this. Maybe sure. you're used yeah. to playing in a different environment with different roles um, and different people, and there needs to be some adjustment here. Um, yes. Or like maybe, maybe someone said or did a thing and how they meant for it to come across and how it came across was very different. Or they have a different threshold for like sensitivity or a different sense of humor or whatever. And no one is really wrong or right. It's just a misunderstanding. And then there are times where you just need to get the hell out of there, Chief. 
Yeah. And so like, there are other times where like that, that campaign is not worth uh, your mental sanity or emotional well-being. True, I mean, uh, no, cam- no campaign, nothing is worth your mental sanity or emotional well-being because if you don't have that, you can't do anything else. Um, to which like I'm preaching to the choir right now that also needed mm-hmm. to hear that message in the past. So I- I'm aware. Very much pot, kettle, black situation. We've, we've both been there. We we were once people in glass houses and we're, we're getting some good plywood up over those <laughs> Those best paints. Just chucking stones We've here and there and waiting for it to crumble. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I actually just recently had this conversation um, with uh, my partner. And when discussing, you know, how to play like antagonistic characters um, and how to do that well without it broaching on that degree of like, am I making people uncomfortable at the table? Am I being a toxic player? Um, or, you know, as the GM, like identifying those things, uh, identifying when you yourself like are, are doing some toxic behavior, um, and things like that. Um, that's an interesting little subset of it that I hadn't thought about, but that bit of like, how do you balancing and how do you make villains villainous and believable and compelling and the threat seem worth it and you know worthy of concern without getting to a point where like oh you're just you're actually hurting the real people that are sitting Mm -hmm. across you that's 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 an interesting one for sure i think i want to start with like toxic players like we've we've met them seen them (laughs) unfortunately had to be at tables with them um yeah 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 (laughs) <laughs> and this is where things get tricky but we are not going to name no names all in and no. here um no, no. but also you know outside of the one particular campaign that you and i can mention i've also had this like in other other environments other situations oh i have too yeah. yeah to be fair I and like for me specifically a toxic player um is i think the big emphasis the a big specific example i can think of is this like interaction that we had a couple weekends ago um, where we were sitting down for our game and someone uh, in our campaign invited like someone uh, to watch. And like the, this person doesn't, has not played D and D um, is not experienced with it. And like, you know, we're very open to people watching and like learning about the game and all this, but then certain questions were being brought up where, you know, why like, Oh, I would love to play a villain. And we were like, well, yeah, like there's a way to do that. Sure. Um, and then just it, it kept being hearkened to, you know, oh, I would want to like sabotage uh, other players. I would want to be working against them. I would want to, you know, I would be rooting for the death of the players kind of thing and having yes. secrets, et cetera. And it just started going down the rails of like, okay, th- to a certain degree, to a very big degree, actually. Um the key words are collaborative storytelling. <laughs> yes. Like you are working together as a party and you as the players understand that you are working together towards some common goal, whatever has been set before you. For sure. The DM is tying your fates together mm-hmm. uh, to work to a certain end and you are stronger working together collaboratively in the story. Y- yes. And even if you That's- have players or you have characters, not players, that are antagonistic or, you know, do have their own agendas or their own motivations, which I think, like, in all our campaigns, like, all of our characters, they have their own reasons for being wherever they are, but there has to be that common thread of teamwork, at least because it will serve whatever primary interests we're all going after and i mean you like when in the ravenloft campaign my backup character who i was going to take over obviously i think we i mentioned this briefly last episode uh neris like she i mean she was well and truly a psychopath and i built her like that oh she's just a she was not always like that but she was very very broken by you know strahd and Mm -hmm. It just, that was where we were at. And I was going to have a lot of fun playing with that. Um, 
can have her like she was Strahd's creature and she was going to join the party. And ultimately, that would mean Strahd would see where the party was, wherever they went. And she would have to report to him because she he was her patron. Uh, and so it was setting up a lot of really interesting things. And the DM and I had talked about different ways that it could go. And it's like, does she betray them in the end? Or is it sort of she figures out and untangles some of her own past and her own trauma and sort of tries to break out of that patron contract? Um, and like all of that was left, was going to be left in to see how it played out in the game. Mm -hmm. But there was a very specific way we both the DM and I had to do it and had to prepare for it. And it had to be handled very intelligently. Just, I, I don't think that person in question would have had the grasp on what they were doing in order to pull off what they wanted to do. Yeah. There we go. And I, I think <laughs> that's, that's, I, that's as blunt as I'm going to get. And that, there yeah. you go. I think, but like, I think the big emphasis with that is like when you want to play a character that might have antagonistic tendencies or at the very least a conflict of interest in their motivations with the party that they're with. Sure. I think the big key emphasis is like there is a difference between having, you know, being like a secret baddie that's like, you know, a, a, a what's it called? Like a, like a sleeper cell situation. Yeah. Uh, where, you know, you've been planted, you've worked with the DM about how this person, this character is going to eventually betray the party. Right. And, uh, or, you know, maybe not, maybe they grow to love their party and then like, they have a, their own conflict of interest in their original mm -hmm. motivations going into it versus yeah. what has developed afterwards. I think the key, the key takeaway is like, one, you're working with the DM on that storyline. A lot of the times those motivations are, you know, from your backstory. Uh, those motivations are also secret. Um, yes. And you are trying to do things on the low. And yes. that can have very great big payoffs. And like also, like I think that a major point is like inner party conflict, I don't think is something to necessarily shy away from don't be scared to make these kind of like maybe antagonistic characters or that like kind of brush shoulders with other party members in certain ways just because of the differences of your characters i think there's a lot of great moments rp wise that can come from that we've had plenty of great moments that have come from like half the time we get into a a, a new campaign with the, the people that we play with and yeah. we're like metaphorically holding guns to each other's <laughs> characters <laughs> oh uh, yeah room but then us as the players, we're like, oh, this is great. We're just stirring the pot between our characters oh, and yeah. loving the 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 conflict of it. Because we know the at the end of the day, party. Yeah, the strict saving party, we all fucking hate each other. Oh yeah. Right now, y'all are y'all are beefing hardcore. Yeah. But the difference is like your characters are beefing and working against each other a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, but then you, the players, like as soon as your intense scene where y'all are literally like, fuck you, no, fuck you after your scene is done yeah. and move on, you're both like, like, you know, uh -huh. like waving your little fingers at each other and having a, yeah. a key key moment. Uh, and once the camera pans to someone else, it's like watching personalized reality TV where it's just like, yeah. you're living for that shit. And I think exactly. like, I, I agree that inner party conflict can be really interesting and engaging and fun to play with. The only thing I would caution again, I'm speaking in generalities, but I think players who are new to the game, I think mm -hmm. it can be tougher than if this is like the first character you've ever played. Um, I think that environment can be stressful. Like maybe it wouldn't be for everyone, but I know it would have been for me. Um, mm -hmm. And also if that group you are playing with, like you really have to gut check and like whether it's you as a player or the, the DM or like whoever, truthfully, everyone needs to do it for themselves you really have to gut check of like all right how close are we actually like there are not yeah. feel like you don't care about each other but there are levels of friends and that's mm -hmm. perfectly healthy and normal and if you don't really fully trust the people you're playing with and you're not really fully comfortable with them then it is very very easy for that 
in character animosity to start to feel like and turn into very actually uh interpersonal animosity and that can contribute to a doctor yeah. very quickly which for we sure. definitely had yeah and i think like for example like especially when you don't know the players at your table that well like i can recall a moment with one of my online campaigns where uh, it's like my monday one where we're doing like call the uh, uh the witch light carnival one uh um, wild down the witch light that one and we're doing that one it's it, well it's that in a mix of like a different campaign he's kind of meshed two campaigns yeah. together mm-hmm. um but i remember like i had just joined that group and i was familiar with like a couple of people uh but not everybody and i remember there being a point where i clock like i'm one of two women in that party um and i remember clocking like something about one person's character kind of speaking often for the other other woman in the in the party Mm-hmm. and just the way that it was it was going off i was like something about that is rubbing me wrong <laughs> and so yeah. i would i messaged the 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 girl privately being like hey you know if i'm misreading this by all means feel free to like disregard it but i just wanted to check in with you that you were okay with how this is going because it's kind of reading to me like this and they were like oh no me and sam have played together in so many games like this is like something we're we're actively doing like it's all gucci and i was like oh okay perfect but like, like great you know, <laughs> glad i did some, yeah That's to somebody wild. that like absolutely doesn't know the people at the at the table quite yet that was reading differently uh so it's definitely something that like you've got to be very comfortable with the people at your table and they got to know you as a person uh to know that like these things that you're you're saying in the moment as this character are not coming from any real life held beliefs or you know yeah. triggering any things with with other people um but yeah i think like the the whole you can play antagonistic characters they can do things that kind of sort of counteract like the party's overall goal or you can be doing things like really on the sly that like the party is even unaware of mm-hmm. what's going on um and but like then there's Then there's when you start verging on toxicity for me is when you are actively doing things to sabotage (laughs) other players. Yeah. And like writing it off as like, that's just what my character would do. And you're like, homie. And you're like, your your character's an asshole. And I feel like that says something about you. Yeah. But it, it, it is to the end of like, like you could be working against the party in your ultimate big brain goal, but you know that for from here to there, your party at least has to think you're on their side. Like sure. there's a way to go about that. Like, for example, like we had a situation in the Ravenloft campaign where one character was playing like a pretty, pretty unlikable character. Um, and I think yeah. I can specifically remember that we got into a situation where we got into combat like in a graveyard or something and all of us got like yeeted to separate areas underground of the graveyard Mm. and this other character stood outside the graveyard watched us get attacked and didn't do anything did nothing yeah like did nothing for the entirety of that combat scene and let us you know go into it and like you know over the table especially in a ravenloft campaign you're like, hey, if we're party splitting or if we're down a party member in an interaction that the DM has planned for the full party to be in combat, that can set us at like an extreme disadvantage. There are certain settings where it's like if your party splitting, you should not. Um, Ravenloft is one of them. Curse of Strahd, uh, Icewind Dale, <laughs> you know, like the, there, yeah. there are certain settings where it's just like, hey, yo, don't. Um, <laughs> that's not for you. Like, do it in fucking Faerun, or sure, if you want to bebop off to different areas, but not here. We're all going to die. But that was one of those things that, like, I remember distinctly we, as people, players over the table, were like, yo, why? why?" Yeah, I was, (laughs) like, resisting there to just bash my head in on the table. Yeah. Like, how obvious would that be? Yeah, and they were just kind of going off on, like, this is uh, is just what my character would do, and he's kind of a, he's a selfish character, and he wouldn't care that y'all are getting attacked right now. And I was like, okay, well, you know, 
I don't know. I don't know what else to tell you at this point. Um, as yeah, far as your choices like, as a person. Then I can take my monk and say she's a selfish character. She wouldn't care if she clocked you in the spinal cord right now, right? Like, yeah, it's that thing of if we go down that road, how then far? It, when does it this stop? is suddenly a PvP and and none of us get to have fun? Yeah, uh, and it's this thing of if you don't. I think that was a situation where that person just wasn't fully invested in the campaign. Like they did end up kind of stepping back after that. And I mean, that probably explained a lot of what happened in that campaign was it's just they had a lot of other stuff going on and they didn't really have headspace or energy to be there. Um, yeah. But which is which is fair, but I still think like in those moments in those interactions, and I think that's an example of like when those character actions are starting to come into play and then we, people at the table are feeling some kind of way about it. I think we even sat down and had a conversation about uh, other things um, because like, I think my character and Bex's character made some character choices that like made other characters feel a certain kind of other players feel some kind of way because like we didn't even hear what was suggested and we just like went and pulled the trigger on, on an action that we could. Yeah. There was, like, an old deity, like, alligator, whatever, that, like, yeah. you and your character and Bex's character ended up killing in a way that, and the DM described it in a way that was, frankly, horrifying. Um, and not horrifying in, like, a, oh, this is a horror campaign. Horrifying in, like, I feel like I'm watching something with a Sarah McLaughlin musical background. And they like, are. it was just <laughs> uncomfortable yeah bad to to listen to um yeah and then there was just kind of that like awkward moment and then yeah so we were quite upset and so we're like okay like we reconned it and yeah but to I your, the to big your thing Bex's is... credit like you were very receptive to back to like okay fair like i didn't hear i didn't hear that said or i didn't hear there be another idea we didn't yeah. well that's to, the like, difference run the like thing into the ground like we'll happily you know retcon it and take another stab at it and be a bit more outwardly collaborative um or like insistent on asking like is everybody cool with this and not just trying to move a story along because exactly and I think that's the big the big major difference is like when you identify those like character choices that are are making other people feel like maybe, you know, they weren't heard in the decision or what have you, or like it's starting to broach an uh, a point where there's starting to be in-person conflict and not just in a character conflict. Um, we sat down, we had a conversation about it. Those things were pointed out to me and Bex. And we were like, oh, absolutely. Like, I didn't even hear these people make the suggestion. And we thought we were just rolling with the punches at this point. But that's on us. And you're and like, you're correct. And like, we'll retcon it and we'll do better next time. Like, take accountability for when mm -hmm. you've done something that's not great and like, move on. And that's okay. But the difference is between that versus in that moment, we also addressed some of the actions of that other player that we were like, hey, your character specifically has left us out to dry multiple times. And I'm feeling this kind of way about it as a player. Uh, that person did not want to take accountability, did not want to apologize, did not want to change or adapt to the way that they are playing uh, to the, you know, to the benefit of everybody else. It's like you're choosing to tell this story with. And right. eventually it led to that player, you know, not not continuing with us. And like, I, I think I didn't like, it's hard to find that balance, but there's a difference between something that was done, um, not thinking about it in the moment, and then something that is done intentionally and unapologetically. Sure. And yes. that's where like toxicity starts to take hold at the table. For sure. I think for me, the big thing, you gave me a nice jumping off point and saying like, the people that you cho have chosen to tell the story with because like we touched on the collaborative storytelling aspect of it earlier but i think that is truly like the very good games are very good because everyone at that table is playing to support and serve this collaborative story that we're all weaving and like yeah everybody has their own things going on and their own side threads and different moments where you focus on different people and pull in, pull out. But 
it's it all comes back to being collaborative. And I think there is at times a problem where some like it's easy if you especially think when you're newer to playing mm-hmm. any TTRPG um, and having other people and trying to balance those different needs and stories and aspects. It's easy if you're not used to that to focus or to want to just push for what you want for your character and try to be like, I am the main character and everyone else is a sidekick. Um, And that gets frustrating to put it mildly very quickly because it can spiral into like trying to play favorites or getting things to getting the dm to like let things fly with you that wouldn't fly with other people or being upset if something happens or a decision is made and your character isn't the center of attention Um, yes and that that was an issue in the last campaign the ravenloft campaign that we were in Mm -hmm. um and i think the contrast of the campaigns we play in now, obviously Strixhaven's an easy example because it's just us, you know, Bex and Alyssa. Um, we do a really great job. I think you do a really great job as a DM of flipping between <laughs> thanks, <laughs> but flipping between everyone's character and giving everyone their time to shine and to explore whatever their imperson- their personal motivations are and then having those like scenes where it's two of us or three of us or a couple of us in NPCs and then everyone is a party mm-hmm. like you you balance those really well and i think but the it's easy to do that as well because everyone at that table wants to see what's going on with everyone else's character and what's going on with the NPCs to be fair mm-hmm. so we're happy when it's our moment to shine but we're equally happy when we get to sit back and yeah like fangirl over whatever the fuck is happening to someone else yeah absolutely and yeah i think the 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 main character syndrome that can that can take over is is a rough one especially when dealing with like a toxic player cuz it like we had a lot of instances where it was you know, that player kind of running off on their own to go do their own thing, which is not necessarily to be discouraged, but it was just so often. And if like, you know, eventually at some point, like you want to develop relationships with the people that you're with, uh, like partying and uh, partying with and all that stuff. And like, it just, it just starts to take hold and like, I don't know. It sours the mood. And I, I, it's a, for me, it's like a virus. And once that starts to like breed in the, in the space of, of what you're trying to do with your, your friends uh, and you haven't established a good forefront of open communication, when things like that are happening, things can kind of be let go. And it just starts to like sour the whole thing more and more. And then eventually you start to realize that like, I don't enjoy coming to sit at this table anymore. And at some point it's, it's a matter of like, okay, is it this one player? Uh, And can there be something done about that? Is the DM in agreement with us about that? Or am I the only one feeling this way? Um, And at some point you have to, you have to like, you do a little bit of an analysis of whether if you're the only one feeling this way, and everybody else is cool with whatever style is hap- of play is happening. And that might just be one of those campaigns that you're like, ah, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have yeah. to dip. It just might uh, not be the game for you. Like the style or those people or like in some ways, like you can have friends that you love dearly. And then if you travel with them, you're like, oh, we're going to murder each other. It's similar. It's the same with especially something like improv or TTRPGs or anything where having that compatibility and that chemistry and the complementary skills and approaches is a very big part of it. And it's okay if you don't have that. Like, you're not going to have that with everyone. And it's okay if you don't have it with the set of people you're currently playing with. But you can't force it to exist. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think, can't... like, 
like wait around to see like oh maybe it will be less awful <laughs> at some <laughs> unidentified point in the future um or maybe i'm being dramatic and it's not really that bad and then just you know have a panic attack every time you go to play D, which i did for several months and didn't really realize i was doing until i stopped playing and then started playing in other campaigns where that wasn't an issue and i was like oh that was categorically bad <laughs> for my mental health super and <laughs> like look at the end of the day like no D is better than bad D. yes if i'm gonna be honest yeah no like that that's just 100 percent true that's not a radical opinion yeah like that's, said, like, that's said quite often in the community and it's completely accurate 100 percent but like be- beyond just the, like the the toxic players in, in general for me are very much like a that main character syndrome actively antagonistic and and sabotage uh towards other other players um and like if your only reason is just my character that's just what my character would do like frankly i don't know how to tell you that you're just a bad time at a table <laughs> yeah but like There's, that's just it chief it, it's very fun i mean it's it's always fun to look at the characters you play and sort of i mean it's, it's fun for me maybe it's not as fun for everyone because i don't think it, I don't think normal people psychoanalyze themselves to the degree I do, which is probably a good thing. But it, it's always kind of fun to see like what what's there beneath the surface. And so like, we we touched on this before of like what you're bringing to that table and what parts of you are coming out to play that character. And then sometimes it's just like, oh, you kind of suck. Yeah, like you're you, kind of you have trash player. You have the you have the personality of beige paint that's damp and it's bad to be around you and like like as a player and then it's awkward when you realize that because then it's like ah shit is that also true as a person (laughs) outside the table and then you're reconsidering a friendship and it's like damn all right (laughs) i don't know how to how to how to how to even begin to to start going on that train but i may i may may just leave that that train alone um probably i don't for, not tra- it's not a train it's the fucking trolley problem <laughs> leave it alone. i wish you could understand how we're fighting tooth and nail not to just drop full tea for the yeah. whole internet to enjoy we've debated we're better i mean people. like <laughs> i refuse i refuse i'm like we will obviously never ever ever use names for like we we, we yeah. name people that we currently play with who like have consented to it and like you know the are on good terms with us um but anyone that like we've played with in the past that we're just whether it's like oh we're not friends with that person anymore or it's just somebody that, like we just haven't talked to and like we, we're not yeah. in touch anymore we don't name those people because obviously because <laughs> consent because consent is important but like yeah it's it is that, you know, skipping through a field of bombs and mistaking them for daisies a bit sometimes where we're trying to <laughs> not. Yeah, I, oof, oofa doofa. It's hard. It's a rough one. I don't know. We've de- we might once uh, sometime down the road do a little Ooh. little after dark Ooh. segment. But <laughs> who's to um, say? Because I feel like, I mean, obviously, obviously, uh, like the realm, the realm of D&D, although it's like full of great, happy experiences that you can have and like great memories you can make and great stories you can tell. Sometimes the journey to finding that D&D party that you have a great time with can uh, be a little bumpy. And you run into some people that you're like, "Mm, this was not a great time, both as like friendships and sitting at a table trying to play this game um yeah well it's all relationships right like just yeah even you know no matter like whether you are playing with your best friends like we do in strixhaven or if it's somebody that you're friends with or they're a mix of friends and casual acquaintances or whatever it's still all relationships Mm -hmm. and relationships are tough and they take work and they take a lot of emotional awareness both of yourself and of other people to navigate healthily and it 
sometimes it goes tits up <laughs> and that <laughs> happens and we have to learn <laughs> our lessons for sure um beyond beyond moving beyond toxic players and and that full little ramble um give me i want i want to know your <laughs> your definition of a toxic dm mm. that's an interesting one because i think it is easy to blame everything on the DM whenever there's any mm-hmm. kind of problems in a game. And it's, I, I think a lot of that is unfair, but also some of it comes with the territory because when you step into that role and you say, okay, I'm going to be the conductor of this chaos orchestra and I'm going to drive this train you take on the responsibility that comes with that. And that includes balancing and managing multiple people and everything that they're bringing to the table. Um, So it's a, it's a hard position to be in, but I think, especially when things aren't going well and things are going great, then it's a great position to be in obviously. But for me, I think well, like I can slow it into archetypes, probably. I think fitting into uh, like players with main character syndrome, like DMs that enable that and that don't, you know, direct that away away from that early and often, so they can do it gently and they're sort of they let it build until it's a big thing. I think conflict avoidance is a bad one of that not wanting to address issues and not being aware of toxic things at the table and burying your head in the sand because that's easier. Um, Being overly combative or thinking like your opinion is always right because it's your table. That's Mm -hmm. a big one. That's a big one. Because I say so. Yes. And like, that's a thing where, I think like I've had like not in any game that we've played in together, but in games I played in briefly uh, years ago, like pre COVID days. Uh, I've had a DM that was, uh, was in, inex- you know, self admittedly quite an experience with a D and D in general and wasn't super familiar with the rules, but he was not, he didn't want to admit that in the game. And he would be like, well, I, I don't really know what I'm doing, but at the same time, everything I say is correct because I deem it so. Mm-hmm. And that I'm there because I was the most experienced person in the game. And I'm like, hey, homebrew's a thing. Rule of cool's a thing. However, there are rules and regulations in the game for a reason because they make sense. And we don't get to disregard them just because you, I knew something that you didn't and you feel threatened by that. Because like, that's mm-hmm. weird. Don't do that. Yeah, and so I, I think letting about that. letting ego like take too much of it, or again, like losing sight of that collaborative storytelling, where it mm-hmm. becomes okay. I'm the DM, and I'm trying to tell my story, and treating your players like a cast of characters in a film, like you aren't a director. Not like you know, you're not directing a film, you're not an author writing a book where you puppet everyone else. Yeah, everyone has their own agency, and I think that is part of the hard bit of DMing because you have to account for like the wild card element that's always there, but it's also why it's so fun and engaging and different from other things. Yeah, absolutely. I actually had, um uh, I remember I asked the question on threads. Um, if you're not following us on threads, please do so. We have a great time. Um, it's mostly me shit posting and sharing yeah. all the cool D&D shit that I find through mm-hmm. threads. Um, but it's at Table Talk RPG. Selfish, selfish plug here. But um, I did ask selfish the question. Plug in our own podcast. Selfish plug in our own podcast. But I did ask the question like a while back where I was like, out of curiosity, I want to know people's like what are you, what have been your bad experiences like at a table or with a DM or with other players? Um, and I remember, uh, this person saying something about, I, I'm so sorry if I, if you're listening and I forgot your handle. Um, but I do remember distinctly somebody mentioning that they had a game that they were playing 
Um, and because the DM did not like the direction that the characters were taking in his story, he scrapped mm. the campaign and like started a new one. I remember seeing that. I was skulking about and I was like, Ayo, this is wild. And I was I like, get on my personal threads to reply. And I was like, what? <laughs> like on earth. Like what? Like I am, I would I could never like for, like first of all, let me get on my little soapbox. I might not have been a DM for very long, but I also am a big proponent of like, yes, you work extremely hard as a DM to build a world, to build a story. But at the end of the day, like you are a facilitator to the story that your players are crafting out in your world. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that can take some turns that you did not expect nor plan for. There are times when you will prep for your session and then your players are like, I'm going to fuck around in a shopping episode. And I know you did plan this whole dungeon, but we're going to go do this instead. Like, and you're just going to be like, I, this is going to get tabled for a minute. But yeah. like, if you deny your players the ability to, to to play, to explore, to do whatever, find creative solutions to your problems, you know, like you are you are denying yourself the experience of, you know, a lot of their genuine enjoyment, which is to me where a lot of the best moments come out um, in storytelling. Like there's moments where I'm like, I could not have planned for this in a million years, but then it led us to something that like was extremely meaningful or extremely touching, um, or extremely important for a, for a character or a set of characters, uh, in their development. And those moments are precious. And like, if you're like, I, I understand being invested in your in this grand story you're trying to tell but there is also a level that you have to have a degree of flexibility just in the nature of the game for sure and, like, and i mean you gotta you gotta accept that <laughs> as just par for yeah. the course of the role that you've taken on and like there are other mediums right where you can craft if you have a specific story that you want to tell and you know what characters you know a through g are doing there are other mediums in which you can tell that. Um, and I think a lot of, especially for me of like just getting into DMing and you having DM for a bit now, but again, not, not super, super long. A lot of it for me comes down to one, just not taking yourself too seriously as the person running the game and just also approaching it. And the fact that like, it is also a game for you. And, like, you as the orchestrator of the story should also be having fun. Um, and so it's a bit of, like, don't take yourself too seriously. And then also don't, and I don't mean this to sound, I don't mean this in any, like, rude or cruel way. But, like, don't be a martyr, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if you do a ton of work and, like, something gets tabled or the characters in another direction or something or like the players accidentally one shot you're like <laughs> demi lich or whatever the fuck because you gave them <laughs> too few hp like yeah that that sucks and that's frustrating and like it's valid to feel that way but it's also okay and it's like you can reflect on like okay is it is it still fun and enjoyable and is everyone still having a good time yes then okay your job was done yeah. and it's not it's not that deep at the end of the day. Yeah. Like you, you don't need to <sighs> say no martyr yourself sounds mean, but that's what that you certainly don't have to scrap your whole campaign just because the story wasn't going the way you originally. No, that's ordained. insane. That's insane. Wild. Absolutely wild. Um, like, yeah, no, for, for me, like toxic, toxic DMs, can and 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 this is just me as a humble rule of cool person i think the rules are there for a reason uh and i'm not going to go too much into this because we're going to talk about it in our next episode but um rules are there for a reason they are the foundation in which the game is built upon um but like sometimes there's wiggle room sometimes like your players are just doing cool shit and you want to let it happen um but I think there there's a there's a very delicate balance there between when your adherence to the rules can especially when it's too strict 
can start to dampen a lot of the fun where you're limiting creativity, you're limiting um, all of uh, all of these cool solutions that your your players might be finding uh, because of like one word that's on a description for a spell uh, mm-hmm. kind of thing. And like uh, it can not not to say that that's like necessarily like a toxic DM trait to adhere to the rules too much, um, but I, I think it's a lack of un- of a judgment call there yeah. and even like if you're seeing those moments fade away of like your player's fun and you're not doing something to rectify it and your attitude towards that is like well screw you it's my game and I'm gonna run it how I want to like you're doing it wrong yes like and like I also think like there's no one right way to run a game there's no one right way to be a player or to build a character or to build a world or whatever it all just comes down to compatibility and you know finding people that enjoy the same type of thing that you do because like if you play like we are we our campaigns tend to lean more toward role play than just super math heavy dungeon crawls uh but if you're somebody who loves that and that's why you show up and you're at the table and like you're doing these big hefty encounters, then yeah, it makes a t- it makes a lot more sense for like the rules are going to be very important there and mm-hmm. you're going to need everybody to adhere to them. But if it is a bit more amorphous and it's more role play led and whatever, I think that can leave some more room to interpret things a bit more freely and i mean at the end of the day i think everything we've said like you know an occurrence of this or a couple occurrences of any of these things is not like oh it doesn't spell disaster it's like oh these are terrible people and i should leave i I should run far away like it's it's not that it's when any of these things done consistently in a pattern over a period of time is unhealthy and Mm -hmm. any of these things that continue to be perpetuated after you've had a conversation so like hey this is not this felt bad or this is not really working for me or i'm not enjoying this or i felt hurt or shut down or stifled or whatever because of xyz if you have those mature conversations and it doesn't change anything then just like any other advice and friendships or in a relationship then that is no longer a healthy environment for you to play in and you should stop yeah, you got to keep a lookout for for the red flags in players and DMs alike. And, you know, if a player is getting too big for their bridges and is disregarding the welfare of other characters and as well as other players, um, that might be your sign to either raise a concern about that player, either to them or to the DM. Like if you're not comfortable with direct confrontation and just be like, hey, I've noticed this about this player. I'm feeling this kind of way. I don't know if anybody else is feeling this kind of way, uh, but just wanted to bring it to your attention. But yeah, like it's, it's, I don't even remember what train of thought I was on, but it's, um, if you're not talking to a D like you can address something with a DM and see if they've noticed certain patterns. And if you don't want to just go to the person directly and be like, Ayo, why you do that? Exactly. If you're not confrontational, just go to your DM because like, especially like for me, the way I think about it is my role as the DM is not only just to facilitate your story um, individually and as as like a party together, but my job is also to make myself available to you should there be like those moments of discomfort. And if I need to change and adapt something, if I need to have a conversation with a player on their own, um, like for me, I've taken on that role. It's my responsibility now that like you are all having fun at the table. Um, yeah. because and when I you're having fun, I'm having fun. Right. And if we're not, then you aren't either. And I think, yeah, like you said it exactly that that is part of the responsibility of running a game. And it's an important part of it. Like it, it is more than just planning the encounters and everything. I think the most, mo- a lot of the work in, I would say like in most campaigns or even unless you are in a similar one like our strict saving campaign is an odd example because we're all just so close but Mm -hmm. in any other campaign we play with i think that that dm does have that interpersonal orchestration role as some of it just 
part and parcel. Yeah. And I think personally, like if you, if you are the DM at your table um, and you are noticing those, those traits in one particular player, um, it may end up having to be your judgment call, whether that player should stay at the table or if it's, you know, a time to make a decision about cutting that person out and maybe finding somebody else that would be better suited for everybody else at the party because if it's really if it it's a matter of it is it a compatibility issue amongst the entire table or is it just one particular person um that is just not jiving with the the same vibe as everybody else um because that that can be detrimental to the story that you're trying to play out and the and the game that you're trying to have because you're just you're you're all just there to have fun you're all just there to like play your characters and and tell this story together um and me personally, like, I'm very protective of the vibes at my table. <laughs> like, those are precious. Those are sacred. Um, I'm not going to invite just a random person that I met that I happened to talk about D&D for a few minutes with. Um, I'm going to vet them. I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to test them out in a one shot with other players where there's like low stakes. And it sounds awful, but I'm like, there really is a three-step interview process to sit at my table because I don't want somebody to sit there who wants to just be a bad time for everybody else at the table. Yeah, I think some of that for you and for all of us is that we've had not great experiences in the past, you know, in a variety of different circumstances. And so you want to do better and like we want to be the advocate that we wish someone was for us. Mm-hmm. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I mean, it is, it's always rough when you come to that point of like trying to decide if someone should remain in a game or not, especially if they aren't the one initiating that conversation. Uh, because like nobody wants to be that person that has to kick someone out for, you know, lack of a better way of putting it and i think that's where like yeah it's a conversation with the dm and it's a conversation with that person between the dm and that person and then also a bigger conversation with the group as a whole Mm -hmm. and just out of a sense of fairness to everybody involved uh but yeah it can it can get really dicey because a lot of it obviously does come down to self-awareness and it's like if this Mm -hmm. is if this way this game is running is not compatible with how you want to play do you realize that or you know is is that person's kind of head in the clouds or they're like no 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 it's fine it's like well it's obviously not fine because you're not having a good time and not neither is anyone else Uh, absolutely so that's where i think there is a lot of everybody has to take responsibility for their own needs and emotions and emotional state and be very aware to how they're contributing to the environment at the table regard whether it's good bad or indifferent right and because even if it's bad of like it's not to say oh it's your fault no but you are like i'll use myself as an example i've been in unhealthy games and i've stayed in them because i didn't say anything and I didn't advocate for myself and I assumed that everybody else was fine and I was dealing with a problem and I just kept my mouth shut because that felt easier in the moment. And it's part of my responsibility as an adult and as an advocate for myself to voice issues if I have them. Mm -hmm. And there are reasons that I didn't. And I mean, I think I'm better about it now but it's also something that if you feel like you can't voice those reasons, then that is also something to reflect on. Of like, is this table and is this environment a good environment to be in? If you don't feel safe to make a mistake, to tie it back to my, you know, sketchy segue or potentially be wrong or approach somebody with a problem. Whether Absolutely. they're a player or a DM. Yeah, I think it just comes down to like at the end of the day, one, you as a DM have a responsibility for the energy of your game. And if somebody is like intentionally sabotaging it and cannot be worked with, um, I think you have you have a responsibility to be the one to address those things and make a judgment call if necessary. 
um, as players, I think. And also like to wait to go back is like, as the DM, you need to like hearken back to the lines and veils, uh, establish a good culture for communication at your table so that when things like that do happen, because they happen even amongst like players that like, you know, we we've all played really well together, but that is not to say that we haven't had moments in the past where we've had to like sit down and talk about something. Oh yeah. Um, and take accountability and ownership of our of our decisions in character. Um yeah, and like the so four like, of us, you know, Bex, Alyssa, you and I play so well together because we have had those conversations in exactly. the past. And so now we just have the benefit of sort of already having all that knowledge banked and we don't have to have those explicit conversations anymore, but we definitely had them in the past in other situations. Absolutely. And that's not to say we may not even have to have them in in the future if something does happen, but we've, yeah. we've established a culture where like we're more than comfortable coming to each other. And I think it's very important to establish that whether you are people that have known each other for, you know, forever, or these are brand new people that you met at a bar and you're now deciding to start a campaign together. Um, you know, establish that good communication very, very early. And that way either the players feel comfortable to address it as a group or they come to you about it and you figure out what the best next steps are. And if it's just something that had to be made aware to the person that was doing it, and maybe, you know, they're doing it and they're brand new to D&D and they don't understand the implications of their actions or things like that. Um, just have that much, that mature conversation. If, if you've made the assessment that maybe that player is incompatible with your table make the judgment call. And then just as players in general, like be aware, be observant and be self-aware, especially of whether this is something that is a lack of compatibility with that particular player, or you are just not compatible with that table yeah. and it's not worth your mental health or emotional stability none of that and if you need to dip out of a campaign because it's just not a good mix for you that is okay and that is fine it's not going to be the end of the world and you will find people that you can sit at a table that enjoy the particular style of play that you want for sure and like you yeah you don't get any closer to that by staying in an environment that you're not enjoying or in a place where you're not comfortable because what typically can end up happening there and what could have very easily happened with any of us if we, you know, the four of us hadn't kind of had each other to bounce off of is you just sort of start to get uncomfortable with the hobby itself and build resentment with the hobby itself because it gets mixed up in your brain with just this environment. And so you're like, oh, everything is like this. And it's like, well, no, it isn't. But that's why it's important to monitor and to step back when you need to so you don't sort of tarnish an entire thing that could be you couldn't quite enjoy for yourself because you had a bad experience yeah and i mean at the end of the day like like you said earlier it's not that serious you don't need to martyr yourself it's just a game um and you're just everyone's just here to have a good time so personally if that toxic person is the dm or the player and it's costing you too much strife just dip, just dip and find better people. But yeah, we're at, we're at the end of our episode here. So I hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Table Talk is a podcast brought to you by Mythos Media Productions, bringing you a new episode every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts. Find us on Instagram and TikTok at Table Talk RPG or check us out at our website, mythosmediaproductions.godaddysites.com. All business inquiries can reach out to us via email at info at mythosmediaproductions.com.